The, uh, the next, uh, next presentation uh, will be by Dr. or Professor Mark David LeClaire, who is the Professor of Surgery, uh, of Pediatric Surgery at the uh, L'Enfant, you have to, David, you'll have to correct me. I'm and better at Portuguese than I am Span in L'Enfant. At the Hospital of Mother and Children in France. In France, and uh, he's in Nantes, France, at the University Hospital. And thank you so much for taking your time. I know it's late there, but thank you for uh, participating with us. Uh, thank you very much to you for allowing me to participate to this webinar. Uh, I think we've heard fantastic lectures so far. So the, the aim of this presentation is to describe um, the main urologic injuries uh, that can be observed in the context of trauma, and that includes all the urinary tract from the kidney to the urethra. Although I have to admit that we're going to focus mainly on the blunt trauma uh, as opposed to perforating um, injuries. So we start with the kidneys, uh, and, and the first thing to know is that the kidney is in children much more vulnerable than in adults because it is proportionally larger, it lies lower in the abdomen, it is less protected by the fat and less protected by the ribs. Uh, the other thing is that blunt renal injuries are very rarely isolated, and you'll find up to 80% associated injuries to other organs. Hematuria uh, is a very reliable clinical sign, which is absent in, let's say, less than 3% of all the kidney injuries. There are two noticeable exceptions, which are the PUJ disruptions and the vascular pedicle injuries, but it is almost never isolated, as you know, so you have associated signs. An important data is also that hematuria is not correlated with the, the severity of the trauma. When it comes to imaging, um, it is common knowledge that the ultrasound is unreliable with a very low sensitivity to detect parenchymal damages. So the CT scan is the gold standard, uh, and it's on the CT scan that all the classifications are based. Um, this is the, the, the most widely used classification um, that most of you may already know, with grade 1 showing uh, only contusion and subcapsular hematoma, the grade 2 with minor laceration, the grade 3 with a deep fracture into the parenchyma, but all of these are without uh, extension into the collecting systems, meaning without any urinoma. The grade 4 is a major fracture with a large perirenal hematoma or urinoma and sometimes some shattered fragments. And the grade 5 is either a PUJ rupture or more classically a shattered kidney due to pedicle evolution. The main message in terms of treatment is that surgery is required in only exceptional cases, probably less than 2%. Uh, the shock is very uncommon in isolated renal injury, and patients may be transiently hemodynamically unstable, but almost always the perinephric hematoma will tamponade the bleeding. Uh, there could be exceptional indications for surgery in isolated renal injury. It could be in very severe grade 4 or 5, hemodynamically unstable with pulsating, uh, expanding retroperitoneal hematoma, but even in these cases, uh, superselective arterial embolization uh, should be viewed at the first-line treatment. One remaining question is whether a retroperitoneal hematoma should be opened during the surgical exploration of other associated abdominal organs injuries. And the general answer is no at least not before you've made sure that the other kidney is normally functioning, and no unless the imaging have shown at least a grade 4 or 5 lesion. A controversy also uh, does exist about the necessity of stenting in the presence of urine extravasation. Uh, the experience and the published data show that the vast majority will resolve without any form of intervention. Uh, there may be an indication to drainage, either by a nephrostomy tube or percutaneous drain or JJ stent when you are facing a large urinoma um, that is still enlarging after several days and in case of symptomatic urinomas responsible for a nightmare. But still, uh, the good option is probably to drain outside through a percutaneous drain. The message is, in all cases, remember that the ureter, at least if it is intact, is the best natural motor 
for drainage of a kidney with normal peristalsis and that a JJ stent won't do that any better. Another controversy right is the here. role for surgery in the stage five. Oh, well, they took it away. Injury. You get the vote. The, the first point is that On there here. are seldom it's isolated it's and like surgical like. exploration might be required for another reason. Uh, another point is that ideally uh, the salvage repair should be performed at least within the first six or 12 hours, which is rarely uh, possible. And it is a difficult procedure with a very low salvage rate. So one may balance this indication with the risk of destabilizing a child who is otherwise hemodynamically stable. And finally, when facing an uncontrollable bleeding, arterial embolization, again, should be considered first with now very high success rates. Now we move to the ureters, uh, and I have to say that it is a rare finding, which is anyway very often misdiagnosed in the majority of cases. The mechanism is often an extreme hyperextension, which is um, uh, when it is recognized early, the ideal treatment might be an external drainage or internal stenting, but when it is diagnosed late, then the management will depend on the site of injury, the level on the ureter, the delay after the trauma, the type of complication, and there are several surgical techniques that can be used depending on the level of the injury, relying on the direct repair or derivation or reimplantation into the bladder. Uh, the bladder injuries are significantly more frequent, and the big message is that more than 80% are associated with pelvic fractures, especially the extraperitoneal ruptures. In extraperitoneal bladder perforation, bladder drainage is usually sufficient during two or three weeks, whereas in intraperitoneal rupture, the surgical repair will be mandatory. Uh, morbidity is very high, but this is usually in relation to associated lesions. Now comes the big part with the urethral injuries. Uh, of course, one must differentiate between the anterior and bulbous urethral lesions from the posterior ones. Most of the bulbous urethral injuries result from a straddle fall when the urethra is compressed against the inferior pubic arch. They are often misdiagnosed as they may cause uh, only minor dysuria that remains unrecognized. They may uh, reveal later uh, by a stricture causing some dysuria or infection. When it is diagnosed early, the ideal treatment remains uh, stent insertion or direct, uh, direct approach for primary repair. Now, the posterior urethral injuries uh, mostly result from pelvic fractures. The prostatic urethra and the bladder neck lesions are specific to the children, and the main prognostic factors will be uh, whether the rupture is partial or complete and the level of extravasation according to the urogenital diaphragm. As far as posterior urethral injury is suspected, you should get a retrograde urethrogram first before you make any decision. And also get a cystogram, knowing that you may find up to 15% of associated bladder ruptures when there is also a pelvic fracture. This is a type 1 injury with uh, just a stretching of the posterior re uh, urethra without any rupture. Um, this is a type 2 injury uh, that present with a partial or complete rupture, but above the urogenital diaphragm. And the type Three injuries, like in this case, um, uh, indicate extravasation at the level or below the urogenital diaphragm. Now, the main controversy in the initial treatment of posterior urethral ruptures is focused on the complete ruptures. Because simple bladder drainage uh, with secondary repair offers the advantage of a planned surgery in a controlled environment on a stable child. But strictures will develop in nearly all patients, and they are often long-gap strictures. So the best choice is probably represented by primary realignment uh, of the urethra over a catheter. Uh, this is either endoscopic or surgical realignment requiring open cystotomy. 
uh, it will be the procedure of choice in a complete rupture uh, with a long defect, especially in children in whom uh, surgical exploration is more often required due to associated uh, pelvic neck injury or rectal perforation. A viable alternative uh, might be to perform a primary repair, which can be done immediately or slightly delayed up to five or six days after the trauma. This approach is to be considered in complete ruptures of the prostatic urethra with or without bladder neck injuries through a, a transpubic approach, which is much, much easier in children than in adults. The morbidity and the sicile rate are very high after pelvic fracture with urethral injuries. We know that incontinence and impotence occur uh, more as, as, a, as a result of the initial trauma rather than a consequence of the surgical repair. But at least in adults, they seem to be observed more frequently in case of primary approach as opposed to simple bladder drainage. But actually, uh, the, the main problem is represented by the risk of strictures. And as we said, there are some evidence that the strictures rates vary widely according to the surgical strategies chosen. So this is the strategy uh, we propose. In type 1 injuries without extravasation, we perform a simple, in, 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 we put a simple indwelling catheter that might be sufficient. Uh, in minimal defects and partial ruptures, bladder drainage or endoscopic realignment are probably the good choices. And in complete ruptures with large defect, one should attempt, if possible, if, if the condition of the child allows it, one should attempt at surgical realignment or even surgical primary repair through a transpubic approach whenever possible, um, uh, especially if there are associated uh, pelvic, bladder, rectal injuries that require surgical intervention. But it is obviously the general condition of the child, the hemodynamic stability, and also the, the, the coexistence of other organs, lesions, that will greatly influence the decision-making process. So as a conclusion, there are, these are the main messages. For kidney injuries, CT scan is the gold standard. Uh, surgery is seldom necessary, and arterial embolization has a big role to play in isolated vascular injuries in children who uh, otherwise do not require surgical exploration. Remember that bladder and urethral uh, ruptures are very often associated with pelvic fractures and that in posterior urethral high-grade injuries, uh, primary realignment or even repair uh, may be a good option. Thank you very much. Dr. LeClaire, that was spectacular. Thank you so much. That's a, an amazing amount of information in 10 minutes. So congratulations and thank you. It was very clear. Um, I appreciate it. All right, we're going to, I hope you can stay for the panel uh, so yeah, that uh, we're going sure. to discuss a little bit more about these issues. So thank you very much. The next. Uh,